Good morning. We're not going to start for it yet. We're just going live to make sure everybody can sign in, get all the logistics worked out. We'll be starting here in about a oh, minute and a half or so. And uh, for those who know me, yes, I, I do have my copy. I'm ready to go. I got Mickey, Mickey here to join me on my, my day. And uh, I'm watching the snow coming in. Though it stopped right now, so that's good. That's a good sign. Good afternoon, Al. And yes, we have the question and answer all set to go. Okay, we're at uh, two o'clock. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, welcome to the Thursday afternoon webinar on the new Little Green Book and Local Highway Geometric Standards. My name is David Orr. I'm the director here at the Cornell Local Roads Program. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun today. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to launch a poll here. So when they come over and hit the poll, I want to find out a little bit about you. And plus, it'll give folks a bit of a chance to log in and get things like that. Uh, just a note to you, if you're Taking the poll, you have to answer all three questions before you hit the submit button. So there's three questions. There's how many folks at your site? Uh, who do you work for? And finally, how long have you been at your job? And in this particular, that particular case, uh, you know, just put in how long the, if you got more than one person, sort of what the longest person is kind of thing. And there's currently 54 of you uh, re sitting online. So We'll see if we can get to at least 40 or so, and then we'll move on. Okay, that gives me a sense, and the last few people can log in. That just gives me a sense of who's in, in the room. Okay, and then I'll share the results with you. So again, as we've been seeing, most of you are by yourself. Uh, that's the way it is right now, the world of social distancing and all that. But quite a few of you are sharing a screen. You're probably in a place where that's easy enough to do. And a few of you even have a 10 or more. Most of you work for local governments, some for states and consultants. And uh, nobody works for the weekend today. On the other hand, I get confused on what day is the weekend, but that's OK. And then finally, in terms of how long you've been on your job, a uh, few of you brand new, uh, quite a few of you over 10 years. So cool, that helps me quite a bit as we get talking and going on here. Okay, so let me get the poll out of the way and we'll get started. Now, a couple of other things just so you are aware of it and we can be on the same page. There's some settings. Um, if you're having a hard time hearing or something, put it into the question and answer pod. Uh, that should be up, helpful for you, but uh, check your audio settings over on the left if need be. If that's going to be an issue for you, just go down there, look for that. You can pick your speaker, things like that. Chat has been disabled. Okay. You can raise your hand if you have an issue. I may even ask you to raise your hand at times to answer a question. So be sure you can do that. So be able to raise your hand. In fact, before I forget, I need to list the participants so I can see when you've raised your hand. So somebody could raise their hand for me so I can make sure I can see that. Cool, that's perfect. Okay, you can leave all over them all now. But again, if you have a question at any time, please put them in the question and answer pod. Okay, don't hesitate to ask the questions. Uh, that's what we're here for is to help you come up with a solution for the day. Now, one thing I realized that we've been doing these webinars and I really haven't actually talked about who we are. And I know we have folks from outside New York State who are being on some of these webinars, and even if you are in New York State, uh, as a reminder, the Corner Local Roads Program, we've actually been around since 1951. And we serve obviously the 1,586 local municipalities here in New York State, but we serve anybody that gives us a call. State DOT, Homeowners Associations, Federal Highway, we don't care. If you've got a road issue, we'll be glad to try to help. And even in the virtual world we're in today, we've actually been doing some technical assistance visits using our friend Google Earth and things like that. So, in fact, there's, by the way, if you're wondering, our first two directors, Jim Spencer on the left, 
and Lynn Irwin on the right. Okay. Now, in the work we do, it's mostly on things like this, extension and teaching you all, but we also do research and research on roads has been going on for a long time. There's all kinds of fun research that's out there. And when my computer catches up, you'll see the next slide that shows an example of this. Uh, so this is actually done by a group called the U.S. Office of Public Roads and Rural Engineering. Today we'd call them the Federal Highway Administration, and it shows the amount of energy it takes to go down a road, depending not only how steep it is, but how good a surface it has. So if it's hard surface, paved, uh, you can get carry a lot heavier load using a single horse. Well, we still do research on that kind of roads at the local roads program, but there's also tons of things out there on low volume roads. And so that's what I wanna talk about today, but I also wanna talk a little bit about local roads and streets. Now, local roads and streets, we think about obviously roads like this that are in rural areas. Uh, narrow dirt roads is something we think about quite often. Um, even wide dirt roads that might service a farm community or have uh, a windmill farm nearby. But a local road and street might serve a small village as well. Um, it may or may not have curbs. So the idea is all of us pretty much live on a local road or a street. Our first mile, our last mile of every trip, once we take them, is on a local roads and street. And I want to thank everybody who's out there working on those roads right now for the work that you're doing for all of us. But the question comes out, why do we need standards? So time for today's first uh, going to push you to work. Okay. If you do me a favor over there on the question and answer, give me a reason why you think we need standards and I'll go through my list and see how we compare. So give me a reason in the question and answer pod on why we need standards. Safety. Yep. Safety is a very good reason. Yeah. Ooh, the first two people are safety. That's always good when it gets made them a minimum quality of a roadway. And so you know what to expect. And you, the public knows what to expect is pretty important. Quality of the roadway, attain a good product. Yeah, some real good answers here. Consistency, especially for signs, but even for the road, we'll talk about that. Not recreating the wheel, okay? Uniformity of design. Yeah, I like this, cool answers, very good, okay? So we don't get 30 foot wide lanes. Yeah, that's probably a pretty good point. Yeah. Someone will always try to cut corners. I like these. These are good answers. Okay. So we're going to move on and watch this the mat through the magic of uh, uh, my lovely Myrmidons and helpers. Uh, Amanda will clear all those. We'll move on. So let's see what I've got on my list. Uh, first thing is on my list, and it's not the highest priority, but I do want to put it on there. We don't want to forget about liability. If you don't have standards and something happens, a crash, an incident, and someone sues you, they're gonna to try to apply someone else's standards that you may not have on your system and may not be realistic on your system. So standards can protect you from lawsuits. So that's pretty important. Safety, that was the first thing people brought up, probably is the single most important reason to have standards, but it's not the only one, okay? Somebody wants to know how many attorneys are in the class. It's okay. You can be, in, I don't mind attorneys. I like attorneys. I had an uncle who was an attorney. He used to tell lawyer jokes. He got students who didn't like it, but he was like, if you can't take a lawyer joke, you shouldn't be a lawyer. Planning. Planning is an, a vital reason. What are we going to be doing five, 10 years from now? Now, obviously right now we're in a period of change, but what are the plans for the future? Where do we think we will be? five or 10 years down the road. We've got to be looking that far out for most of the work that we're going to do. So that's pretty important, okay? If you've got development, you've got growth in your community, then that's something you need to be careful of. Ooh, we have somebody on the thing who's an attorney and an engineer. That's always a great combination. I know a few of those. That's good for you, James, good for you. We need to have development priorities in place. We need to have quality control. Someone had brought that up. It's a perfect thing to have. If you don't have a standard, what do you measure? How do you know you're paying for what you really are asking for? Uh, we have a product here in New York State. Most of you who are from New York know something called item for gravel. And you've probably heard me talk in the past about the fact that that's not a state spec. So when you're buying it, what are you buying? You need good standards so that you can compare against something and test for it. Okay, and then money. I don't want to forget about money, though a lot of times money 
is not a good driver, as we did in our top 10 a couple of weeks ago, money is part of the equation and certainly is going to affect us over the next probably few years. But if we chase the money, but we don't have those other factors of safety and liability, and the last one that I'm going to show you here in just a second, we can have a big problem. Okay. And then, of course, my I think maybe it's important, not quite as important as safety, but still the single most important factor to really work with the public is good communications. If you've got a good set of standards, you can communicate with the public. And so everybody's on the same page. So now I'm going to give you a choice. I'm going to say your community, I'm only going to let you have one width for your road system. Now, I know that's not true. I know that all of you are probably going to want to look at multiple widths. But if I could only give you one width, 10 feet wide, total width of the pavement, 22 feet wide, or 36 feet wide, which one would you choose? OK, and I'll see how people vote here. You can only choose one. And there's a poll up, so, or you can type it in the Q&A pod. That's fine by me. Okay. Okay, we'll get the 75%. We'll see how we do here. Remember, I don't care what the answers are. I just want to see what you've got. I need probably one, maybe two more. Okay, there we go. We're in the polling. Share the results. Okay. Most of you said 22 feet. Uh, people who put it in the Q&A pod said 22 feet. And if you only had one choice, yeah, that might be a good width. Okay. 10 feet might be a little narrow at times. We'll talk, show one in a minute. 36 feet wide. Well, again, the whole idea here is what we need is we need a set of standards that can account for the reality of the world that we live in, okay? So I'm gonna show you three roads that are 10, 20, and 36 feet in width, and they're all perfectly capable of doing the job they need to do, okay? This is the road I live on. It's a dirt road uh, right at the edge of the city of Ithaca, and it's 10 feet wide between the uh, edge of the grass. Uh, it gets down to about nine and a half feet during the summer, but right now it's about 10 feet wide. But it's fine. There's four houses on it. It gets very little traffic. 10 feet is more than adequate. Okay. So a really low volume, narrow road, doesn't need a lot of speed. 10 feet's probably fine. Before I was with Cornell, I was with Yates County, New York, and most of our roads were 22 feet wide between the white lines. The road hasn't been striped yet in this particular picture. But 22 feet was sort of the most common width we used. And for a lot of our county system, our minor collectors, even some major collectors, 22 feet, that's pretty good. But if you go downtown the city of Ithaca, there's parts of the city of Ithaca where it's 36 feet curb to curb. But they need that width because they've got parking, they've got bike lanes in places. You might need different widths. In fact, if you ever come visit us in Ithaca, once we're able to travel, note that in the downtown area, the roads are narrower. Uh, the guy who founded the city of Ithaca, he wanted narrow roads because he'd have more land to sell. Well, the roads down there are very tight and it's really hard to get around if you allow any kind of parking. So you really need to account for the variations that exist. And so that's something I want to make sure we emphasize as we talk about appropriate and reasonable standards. Now, in my mind, a good road standard, one that's appropriate for most local agencies, is clear and easy to understand, meets the needs of the public, and is used for all roadways. Okay, not something too complicated just simple that meets the needs of the public, okay? Now, the most common standard that people have by far is the uh, something called the Ashto Green Book, okay? Now, the Ashto Green Book uh, is called the Green Book because of its color. It used to be a hard cover, now it's a soft cover, but it's green, okay? That's because there used to be a yellow version for rural areas and a blue version for urban areas. And they decided to blend the two together into one big book, hence Green Book. It's nothing fancier than that. But if you're wondering why we call it the Green Book, that's where it comes from. It got its color because the original books were blue and yellow. Okay. So AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, has critical design factors. Okay. So again, 
Let's see what people think in the Q&A pod. Tell me, what do you think are the critical design factors, the things I need to know before I open the green book up and so I can pick out the road design out of the green book? What do you think the critical design factors are? Let's see what we get for some Q&A answers here. Volume, our usage, average annual daily traffic, speed, traffic count, okay. Number of trucks. Traffic load, weight capacity, usage, pedestrian traffic. Yep. Okay. Slope, parking. Okay. Land use, capacity, bike traffic. Yep. All things we could be thinking about. So what I want to do is I want to look back at the green book. Remember the green book, just so you know, is actually the Geo policy of geometric design of highways and streets. We're not talking about thickness right now. That's another session. Um, in fact, I'll give you a date for the next session that's actually on that topic of thickness later on. But there's actually only three major factors, okay? And most of you are getting most of them. The first one is called the functional classification. Is it an arterial, a collector, or a local, okay? So obviously the arterials, interstates, the main roads between cities, the lifeblood of a community and of a state and of, an, of a nation. Collectors collect the traffic, take it to the arterials. These are mostly the major county roads, the roads that connect small communities and towns, okay, villages as we call them here in New York, okay. And then the local roads, the roads where you and I live, okay, the capillary system of the network that is our road system. So that's the first thing you need to know. What kind of road is it? Now that's great when it's pretty easy to tell them apart, but we have roads and we all have these in our system that serve all three needs at the same time. There's a road our program manager lives on that I can guarantee you the people who live there think it's a local road. It's classified as a collector, but it behaves as an arterial, especially when there's certain times of day or when people are coming back and forth with the university makes it hard to design a road in that particular case. The second thing you need to know to get the green book to work for you is the terrain, okay? There's three types of terrain. There's level, flat, okay? The you, folks at the University of Florida um, are doing a training session. Actually, uh, the Art Florida LTAP Center, my fault. The Florida LTAP Center folks at Central uh, University of Central Florida they're doing a session on their green book standards. It's a whole week long thing for professional engineers. Uh, they can use pretty much a, go Knights, very good, I like that. They can use pretty much an entire uh, level terrain for most of Florida. I mean, the highest point in Florida is at Walt Disney World, okay? So they could probably use level down there. Rolling, that would be sort of hilly country. Most of upstate New York is that way, but we have large, parts of the state which are be considered mountainous, okay? The Adirondacks, the Catskills, parts of the southern tier. So you need to know that because obviously if the roadway has to deal with mountainous or steeper terrain, you're gonna have to have variations. If we're down on Long Island, we're mostly level. If we're in the Adirondacks, we're mostly mountainous, but again, roads will vary quite a bit, okay? And then finally, traffic volume, and if you, make a list of all the various major traffic volume splits that exist within the green book. You'll get 50, 250, 400, 1500, 2000, and greater than 2000. There are some nuances when you get to the interstates above that, but now they start talking about hourly volume and stuff like that. But there's breakdowns in this particular case. Once you know those things, a little bit about truck traffic, okay, um, you can move on, okay? And if you're wondering, by the way, the traffic volume is counts in this particular case is a per day count versus an hourly count, okay? Again, as I say, we get large volumes, we're gonna get to an hourly count we gotta worry about. I'm looking at day size counts right now. So we know those three things, we can get the design speed. You actually don't choose the design speed, it comes from the other factors that are involved and that can vary from 20 to 50 miles an hour, quite a big range, okay? Now, one point I wanted to make sure you understand, one of the things that drives a lot of what's in the design speed calculations is the criterion for safe stopping site distance, which essentially is the distance from the eye height, three and a half feet above the pavement sitting in your car, 
and an object that might be on the road into the future, okay, that's two feet high. We used to use, when I was in college, it was six inches. We were supposed to not hit rocks. Now we're worried more about the back end bumper, okay? Just something to be aware of. One of the things that's now in the green book, which I actually like, especially when you start designing collectors and arterials, we don't just use stopping distance anymore. We added something in called the decision site distance. And the decision site distance is cool because it accounts for the fact that when you're in an urban area, it may be harder to see what's going on or you get distracted easier. So you need longer to make a decision, okay? So rather than a minimum distance, they sort of said, well, if it's confusing and there's a lot of reasons why in an urban area it can be, we need to have more distance to allow the driver to keep themselves and everybody around them safe, okay? So the question is, is that appropriate, okay? So I wanna bring up a poll, here we go, poll time again. Okay, I'm gonna bring up a list of numbers I've seen in the past for low volume roads, okay? I serve on the low volume roads committee with uh, TRB and this debate comes up, what is a low volume road, okay? So the choices are less than 50, less than 250, less than 400, less than 1500, less than 2000 or greater than or equal to 2000. And yes, some people say 1,000, but surprisingly, it's not the most common number you see, okay? And yes, that's a per day number, okay? So let's see what we get here. We'll wait till we get the 75% out of you. Getting close. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling, share the results. And over half of you said 400, okay? And that's actually uh, not an uncommon number. You see that quite often at 400 as a very common number. And we'll come back to why that's actually a nice number. If you can remember, it's actually pretty cool. Okay, so what is 400? We could argue about whether 400 is the right number or not, but I'll come back to that. I'm sorry you didn't see the pop-up poll, but again, we will record this. We can uh, talk about those things later on. So the question is, is that appropriate? What's the appropriate standard? Well, if we look at the roads here in New York State, over half the center line mileage are roads of less than 500 vehicles. Now, I know 400 was the number I gave you, but the numbers are collected by the state at 500, close enough. So essentially, if you think about it, more than half the roads in the state have a traffic volume of less than 500 vehicles per day. Okay, but if we look at the portion of roads by distance traveled, vehicle miles traveled, if you prefer, local roads that are less than 500 only make up about 3% and collectors less than 500 only adds another 0.6% of the vehicle miles traveled. Most of the miles are traveled on the arterials, collectors and interstates as you would expect. Okay, and that's where the standards are focused. In fact, back in 1992, a set of guidelines for rural town and county roads were produced by a commission put together by then Governor Cuomo, Mario, not Andrew. And the reason they put this commission together was, and you'll see the quote here, the existing guidelines for the design and maintenance of rural highways having low volumes were not appropriate. And that was the key. They found that the Green Book, while it's very useful, very appropriate, and a good standard for higher volume roads, breaks down and you get really low volume roadways, okay? Now, how did they define low volume? They defined it as less than 400 vehicles per day or equal to 400 vehicles per day, okay? Now, again, we can argue about that number, but 400 makes sense. But how do we know we have 400 vehicles a day? Do you put a tube counter out there? Do you have someone count? I've done some traffic counts in New York City sitting on a cold day. Your fingers get a little chilly, but that's okay. But I'm gonna show you a couple of rules of thumb that are amazingly accurate, especially in rural areas, but even pretty good in an urban area. So in a rural area, it turns out the busiest hour of the day, you're gonna see about 15% of the traffic for the entire day in the busiest hour, okay? In an urban area, that number drops, it's spread out a little bit more, but its busiest hour is about 11%. 
no, I don't know what your busiest hour is. And in a lot of places, it's usually the afternoon traffic because everybody wants to get home. But most of us know the busiest hour of the day. In fact, a lot of us actually probably know, you know, I bet I know when it's the busiest hour is, I can go sort of in the middle of that busiest hour and I can count for 15 minutes. And if you go out and you count for 15 minutes, multiply that times four, and then divide it by that percentage that I just gave you, that'll give you an estimate of the traffic for the entire day. So if you know the 15 minute count, you could actually create a factor, an F factor, that you could then use to get the traffic volume. So for a rural area, that number would be 27. For an urban area, that number would be 36, okay? So a way to think about that is, if I'm standing out there for 15 minutes in the rural area in the morning, and one vehicle goes by me in a minute, that's 15. If I multiply that times four, that becomes 60, and divide by 15%, it becomes 400. So in a rural area, one vehicle a minute in the busiest part of the day is a 400 vehicle a day roadway. That definition of low volume, okay? So it's a good quick way and amazingly accurate, five to 10% in terms of how accurate it can be if you pick the right hour, okay? So the guidelines had within them three road types rather than a complicated longer list, only three. All purpose roads, area service roads, and a one lane area service road. And instead of using terrain, they looked at land use, okay? And the land use types, well, everything from a low volume collector, and we saw there are some of them, all the way up to just recreational land access, okay? Now, if you're wondering, by the way, the difference between a farm access roadway and a agricultural land access, this one, has a barn or a farm on it. This one is just the field, okay? Keep that in mind, okay? And so there were a couple of different road width types, fairly low volume, less than 400, two lanes, two foot shoulder, 16 to 18 feet total width. That's all you need, really pretty good shape, okay? If you got a lot of trucks, okay, with trucks, Maybe we go 18 to 20 feet. Maybe even a couple feet more if need be, okay? So the idea is you go a little wider when you need the width, but don't make it any wider than you have to. So here's a road that 16 feet wide between the snow banks, but also it turns out 16 feet wide when the snow is not there, which I guess will be next month because we are getting snow today. That's fine. That serves the needs of that particular area and the few houses that are there. Okay, the type C road was for very low volume, less than 50 vehicles per day, one lane wide typically with places to pass. Don't really even need a shoulder in that particular case. Okay, and that works in most cases. Before I move on too far, we also have a road type called the minimum maintenance road, which you've probably heard about. There's also a seasonal limited use, which is allowed here in New York State if a road has no houses on it. So that farm access road, you can't make that seasonal limited use because it's got a barn or a farm on it. But if you did the agricultural, you could sim seasonally limit the use and not plow it. But the idea behind a minimum maintenance road, if you're interested, is you could stop plowing it. You could stop doing other maintenance in times of year when it's not needed. Now, is that appropriate? Well, we think it is, and that's why those standards were put together. And it turns out those standards were borrowed by an ASCE APWA publication that was put out and that particular publication was then borrowed again by AASHTO, and they came out in 2001 with the geometric guidelines for very low volume local roads, ADT less than 400. Boy, does that sound familiar, okay? Very similar concept. The only difference is they added some standards for low volume streets as well. They have a couple of more choices for widths. They added in a few things about speed design that weren't in there, and a few more land elements. But look at the road types. Hmm, does this look familiar? Major access, residential access, farm access, same road types, okay? So that thing that started in the 90s is part of this Ashto Little Green Book, okay? 
Now, they did also add local streets, as I said. They got this information from other sources, including the ITE folks, okay? And there you have a smaller list, but still major access, but low volume, residential, but low volume, industrial, commercial access are the urban. And again, we're only talking geometrics, we're not talking thickness, okay? In both cases, the design speed choices, really challenging. There's two, slow and fast, or up to 45 miles an hour or greater than 45 miles an hour. And if you think about it, that's not a bad choice when you think about it. Most of our local systems, a couple of choices is probably enough, okay? Now, they've updated it since, and last year they came out with a new version of the guidelines for very low volume roads, except they dropped the very. It just says the geometric design of low volume roads, and they've changed. Remember in the old one, the ADT was less than or equal to 400. The new one, the ADT, is less than or equal to 2,000, okay? Now, again, what's nice about this is for a lot of agencies, even a lot of counties, this is all you need with a couple of caveats we'll talk about. So the old Astro numbers of 400 vehicles per day are still there. Total width, 18 to 26 feet, including the shoulder. Again, depends on how many trucks you've got, depends on other factors, is it a street? But that's all you have, no wider than that. We don't want, as one person put in the Q&A panel earlier, a 36 foot wide road to justify, okay? And then for roads that were between 400 and 2,000 vehicles a day, we get a little bit wider. And if you want the honest truth, what they really did was they pulled the numbers from the green book and put them into the little green book. It's pretty much exactly the same numbers. And how do you decide on a street? Same information, width depends on whether there's parking or not, and the density, how many houses, how many buildings, how many commercial developments are there and the number of channels, which is a fancy way to say how many lanes, because that can include a center turning lane, it could include a uh, suicide lane or whatever you like to have, okay? Here's what's in the AASHTO local little green book, which I really like. It was in the old guidelines that are still out there too. And it says, if an existing road is working, leave the geometry the same. If you don't have safety issues, if you don't have crash problems, as you change things, don't change the geometry, okay? Now, is that appropriate? Again, we think it's appropriate. It's, it's a good standard, but it's something to keep in mind. You need to decide if it's appropriate for your particular community. Now, there is one thing missing from the little green book, okay? Let's see if anybody can guess what's missing from the little green book. I'll tell you the answer after this, and it might be a PDH question at the end of this session. Let's see if anybody can guess the answer to the question. Stopping site distance? Nope, nope, they actually have that in there. That's a good guess though, I like that. I'll give, see if I can get one more person willing to try. I'll give you a hint. Most of the people who were writing this set of standards came from parts of the Midwest. If they were looking at the Ashto Green Book, their terrain would be level or rolling. No mountainous land whatsoever. Let's see if that helps somebody. Slopes, yeah. There's nothing in there about the slope of the roadway, the, the center line slope, not the cross slope. Okay, so the grade line. Okay, so this particular road right here actually has, a little hard to tell in the photograph, but I have happened to know, has about an 18% grade at one place near the top. Okay, that's a pretty steep roadway. Okay, it's certainly beyond really even a low volume road, which you really want to have. And I feel sorry for the uh, one horsepower about to try to go up that hill. Okay, so what I recommend the folks is, okay, it's not in the little green book, but most states have either adopted the Green Book or they've adopted, you could adopt it yourself. For instance, in New York State, they pretty much adopted the Green Book directly, something called the Highway Design Manual. 
And so you could just pull the numbers from there. So in a mountainous terrain area with a low speed, remember 45 miles an hour, you would be looking at a range of 12 to 15 for a mountainous area. And you might be willing to say, well, you know, I know it's low volume. I'll go ahead and go up to the 15%. Okay. You could adopt that as a, as a good climbing lane number. Okay. Or even just the general center line number. So what are appropriate standards? Well, you can use the Astro Green Book, and I would recommend that for a certain your collectors in your arterials, uh, but maybe the minor collectors, you might be able to go with the Little Green Book. The guidelines that are available here in New York are still useful. They're still a good standard. You could use them, but the Astro Little Green Book pretty much mirrors them. So why not use something that's got a national focus and actually helps you with liability because now there's a bunch more engineering behind it. You could develop your own, but you're probably going to use other people's standards, okay? Now here in New York, we took all of these things and we developed a set of low volume road specifications, okay? Now there's a handout that goes with this webinar that will be posted with it. We'll send you a copy when we send you your certificate or at least a, a link to the uh, handout. And it lists where you can get the standards we put together using the Ashton Little Green Book and a few other things that we've learned over the years. So what I wanna do is go through some of the critical items that are in there so that we're all on the same page and you can understand this. And again, we're gonna be using the question and answer, so I need your help. Now, my number one rule of thumb when it comes to good standards is keep it simple. My name's not Steve though, but that second S, I know it stands for something, but gotta keep it simple, the KISS system, okay? So let's go through the most critical design criteria. The number one thing I always say especially if you're going to accept a road developed by somebody else and it's going to become part of the municipal system, make sure it's been certified by a professional engineer, okay, with a stamp on it, okay? Let them take the liability if they miss something. Don't take it yourself, okay? Make sure that you've got any kind of subdivisions or stormwater requirements included in your standards. It might be a separate document, but make sure you refer to them. If you're going to use a state standard or you're going to use a county standard and you're in a town or a village, great, reference somebody else's standards. I like that idea, but make sure you include those things, okay? Make sure you talk about bridges, okay? Who owns the bridges? What is an acceptable design standard for your bridges? That's a pretty important thing, okay? Uh, let's see here. A comment in the Q&A pod, also the company providing the design has to have a certificate of authorization from the New York State Department of Education. Essentially, they need to be licensed and currently registered, yeah, to make sure you, you know what you're getting, okay? Uh, the link, by the way, is in the chat pod. You can't type in the chat. You should be able to see the chat uh, available from Adam. He put that in there for you if you need to download the link for the handout. Okay, time to start answer, asking some questions. What is the minimum clear zone that you would like to have? And what's the desirable clear zone on a low volume road? Okay. Does the Little Green Book have bridge design standards or a reference? It only references uh, essentially what you'd want to have for geometric parts of bridges, the width of the bridge versus the width of the roadway. It doesn't talk about the structural design standards uh, that are available. We can get you those if you need them. But what would you put in for a minimum or desirable clear zone. And for those who don't remember, the clear zone, remember, is the distance between leaving the pavement and hitting something you don't want to hit or hitting the water or something like that. Okay, so what would you put down as the minimum clear zone that you'd like to see? Seven feet, 20 feet. Okay. 7, 20, 15, it seems to be the most common. Some people want 30. On the interstate system, that's what they're trying to shoot for is 30 feet, okay? Depends on speed. Let me tell you what the Little Green Book says and the guidelines, and you're gonna think I'm crazy, but actually there's reasons behind this. Minimum, whoop, gotta go back here. Get my pen to write, two feet. 10 feet desirable, wider where needed, like on the outside of a corner, okay? So 
you're thinking, wow, that seems to be pretty narrow because there's things that say we need 30 feet. You're not going to get 30 feet. It's just not going to happen. So what they found was a consistent clear zone where you've got more width, where you need it on the outside of a corner, where you've kept good sight distance, is actually just as safe. None of it's going to be perfectly safe. Anybody who says you can make a road perfectly safe would be lying. Okay, but two foot minimum, 10 feet desirable. And again, higher volume, you might want to bump that number up. Okay. And the key is, whatever you've got, don't put artificial things in your clear zone. Okay, a fixed object in the clear zone that's put up by you and I, not a good idea. And if you've got trees that are too close to the road, cutting down the tree does not, <laughs> does not change the clear zone. That is still a deadly fixed object. Okay. Now there's a good question here. How does the clear zone tie into the three rod highway width for road user, for uh, 189 roads here in New York State? Turns out that roadway width, that's a whole different webinar. The width of the roadway for a road by use and the three rods, they're not as linked as we think. The width is driven by what we've used and maintained. The municipal board, the town board could actually pass a clear zone policy, okay? That would then allow them and you over time, not immediately, to not let fences be placed too close to the roadway. Now, obviously, to remove an existing fence would be a little bit more challenging, but the idea is consistency. That's pretty important from a safety standpoint. And in this particular case, some fence post on the inside, I'm not that worried. On the outside, I think the dog will get out of the way. Okay, at least I hope he will. Now, how thick should the roadbed be? Now, again, geometric standards don't usually say this, but we actually put it in our standards that we posted on the web. What would be the minimum thickness and how long do we want that road to last? Let's see, nobody's gonna, nobody wants to put an answer in for that one, I see. Three inches minimum, 18 inches minimum, 20, six, 10 years, okay? Start seeing some different answers, okay? You need to think about what you would like to have for the minimum thickness and the minimum year life. In the version that we supply to people, okay, we usually say a minimum of 18 inches total. That includes any gravel layers, by the way, not the pavement, okay? And the life, well, I'd really like to see us going for 50, but I'll be honest with you, most agencies are 25, okay? 20, I see commonly a lot of you put that in your system. But what is your minimum? Now, one thing I want you to realize, whatever you put in there, all of that is, includes routine maintenance. Build the roads to handle the loads, okay? Don't just assume. So as I said earlier, I would promise you, we're gonna be doing a session on low volume pavement design. Uh, we've got a new tool we came up with. It's gonna be on May 5th. That's gonna be the thickness side of the equation, okay? Now, in terms of driving speed, what should be the driving speed on minimum on all roads? And what would you like to have on maybe some roads? What would be sort of your high speed roadway number? Okay. Forty five, thirty miles an hour on a town road. Yep. Again, you need to think about your consistency. Now we put in twenty five as a minimum because there are places, even though the speed limit might be 30, there are places you might want to go 25. Most of our roads, I would say 40 or 45, okay? And then greater than 45 miles an hour on some roads, which because our state speed limit is 55 miles an hour, you might have that as a standard on some roadways. But again, what is your agency's consistent standards? Consistency is important. Now here's a place where we used to have a dip and you can actually see, I can't really see down the roadway at all. And we actually had a lot of Mennonites and Mennonites would disappear into this valley. Very, very dangerous, okay? We lowered the grade at the two dips on the two sides and straightened the roadway out. Now, a lot of people would go, wow, speed went up, didn't it? Turns out by only about four or five miles an hour. 
but now it's a lot safer, a lot better sight distance, okay? Now, would I do that on a low volume road? Probably not, but consistency is really important when it comes to safety, so I wanna keep that in mind, okay? Now, what is the right of way for a new roadway? I'm not gonna talk about a three rod road and a road by use, but what would you like to have as the right of way for a brand new roadway? Fifty feet, sixty feet. You'd put in a minimum, okay. Uh, most of the time, in fact, we put it in our standards, sixty foot width, width minimum. But the key is, the width needs to vary. If you need that cross slope for safety, the width should be wider. So in this particular case, it goes up to the top of this bank up here. That should be the right of way, as opposed to a situation like this where the right of way is too short and now we have a safety problem okay and so of course we've been talking about geometry so we don't want to forget about geometry we certainly need a minimum width so what's the width you would want to have well again that's where the standards come into play okay and you would pull that out of your standards and put that number in there okay is this road wide enough yeah probably is actually now it's so wide even though it's a low volume little street actually in a village because it services a municipal water and sewer treatment facility. And once in a while, they need to bring in some very heavy, very wide equipment to process and clean. So they need more width, but they don't need more pavement. They just made an extra wide shoulder so they can get in there. So again, what's reasonable for your facility? Okay. Now, Drainage facilities, obviously larger for more important road. We could do a whole session on drainage. We're actually looking at maybe what, doing one in May. But what would be the minimum size of a pipe underneath your roadway, not your roadway? What would you like to have? 15 inches, 18 inches, yeah. Again, what do you wanna be able to maintain, okay? A lot of agencies go 12, a lot of agencies go 18. But what is your operation set up to handle? That's the minimum size you want to put in, okay? So yeah, so that's, uh, let's see, anybody do anything other than 18, 12, or 15? Nope, everybody did about the same, that's good. The idea here is designed for the flood frequency you got to deal with, for your culverts, your storm drains, your driveways, your ditches, things like that. But also, make sure you install them properly, please, okay? More than anything else, I don't want your road failing because the culvert failed. And the clogging concerns that somebody mentioned usually drives the minimum pipe size, okay? So appropriate standards, that's what I'm looking for. I want appropriate standards that are clear and easy to understand, meet the needs of the public and is used for all roadways, okay? And the nice thing about that, if you do that correctly, that clear and easy to understand, everybody's on the same page meets the needs of the public without undue expense and used for all roads, a brand new development, but also your own road when you go to reconstruction. There have been cases where somebody tried to tell a contractor, you have to build to a standard and they weren't building to that own standard themselves. And the court said, well, that's not reasonable. And they were allowed to build a road that wasn't as a high quality as the town really wanted. So make sure if you've got a good set of standards, you follow them yourself. So you don't wind up having to accept a road that really you didn't, wouldn't have built if you built a road yourself from scratch, okay? So a couple of things that uh, we have to do some questions because this class is worth a professional development hour. So let's uh, see how you folks go, okay? So we're gonna be talking about, does anybody know what the critical heights are for stopping site distance, okay? I didn't mention them earlier, but let's see what people say. 42 inches and 24 inches, three and a half feet and two feet, which by the way, are the same thing. As long as you know your unit system, I don't really care. So yep, the answer is everybody's good. Good to know everybody remembers these things correctly. Three and a half feet of the eye. I did say that one. Height of the object, back end bumper. Think of it that way, okay? Passing site distance, by the way, it's three and a half feet because now we're passing a vehicle, but three and a half feet, two feet. Okay, so very good. Nice job, good answer. Okay. 
let's do the next one. What geometric standard is missing from the little green book? Let's see how y'all do here. Slope, grade, yep. Yeah, grade is the more commonly used phrase for the center line. Slope is usually the one used for the cross slope, if you hear both of them used, though a lot of times we use them almost interchangeably. Okay, but it's the center line grade, center line slope. Okay, that's missing from the little green book. Again, just needs to be something you need to think about putting it in. Okay, so pick the standards that are used within your particular state. Here in New York, we would use the New York State Highway Design Manual as our minimum standard, okay? So now I wanna do a little bit, a short little case study. It's a 10 minutes off. So we're gonna do a little case study. It'll take us about four or five minutes and then open it up to your questions, okay? So I got a little low volume road here, okay? Now, this little low volume road has a 15 minute count. I went out in the morning and I counted 12 vehicles per day. I saw a few agricultural trucks. There's a few residents on there, okay? So what I want you to tell me is, what is my traffic count, okay? And I gave you the list of possible land use types. What land use type am I gonna choose from the six that I give you here, okay? So let's do that and then I'll open it up. I've already seen one person has put a question in there. We'll answer those questions. We got plenty of time. So let's see if anybody comes up with, somebody says 400 vehicles per day or less than 400. What's, yep, somebody's got the answer in there. Let's see if somebody else gets, agricultural land somebody chose. Okay. So the traffic volume count you should have gotten if you take, remember that multiplier, the 37, but also you could take it, multiply it by four, divide it by 0.15. You should get a count of around 320 vehicles per day, okay? So that would be the very old, very low volume. Most of the roads in the little green book, that's what it would fit into, okay? If you do the direct multiplier, you'll be a little less, 312, 315 actually, or something like that. But the key is you've got your count and you're actually pretty close, okay? Now, when people say agricultural trucks, they're thinking, oh, it's agricultural land. But what did I say the difference was between farm access and agricultural land? The farm, yeah, farm access, there's a barn. There's a structure there. You can't use agricultural land if there's a structure. And even if there's only residents and no actual farm, you've got to at least go to one of the choices that has a building on it. So the ag land and the recreation land are roadway types that don't have any structures. So you'd have to choose from either a residential access or farm access because you've got agricultural trucks, you probably need the extra width that's given so it would be a farm access in this particular case, okay? Now, what vehicle type have I not talked about yet? It's pretty important. It's actually a design vehicle I, I would use when I would design small culverts and small bridges. And actually, anytime I'm looking at uh, safety features, it's my most important vehicle. Tractor trailer, fire truck, I'm looking for it. Tractor, tra possibly got to worry about tractor trailers. What kind of bus? So he said bus, up oh, there it is, school bus. Yeah, I always sort of go back in my mind and I say, what is a school bus uh, gonna need? I wanna, that's my minimum. I always worry about the school buses, especially when I see a residence, because you and I both know there's probably gonna be a school bus going down that roadway. So keep that in mind, okay? So now we have a few minutes, I wanna open it up. Uh, to your questions, okay? I'll uh, go ahead and put up my uh, thank you here. And so let's uh, let's go see what, see what we've got. Yeah, it, it is everywhere in New York. There's school buses everywhere. Last time I checked, in fact, one of the sad realities uh, when we get back to uh, going to school in New York State, prior to this uh, craziness we're in right now, there were seven to 10,000 school buses passed 
every single day with the stop sign out and active. So it's a sad reality. So questions that were put into the chat pod, are you gonna discuss non-standard feature justification? Remember I said consistency is important. And if I had to pick the one thing you wanna to try to avoid is going too far from a non-standard feature. If you've got one that is existing and you have no evidence of crashes, no evidence of serious safety issues, you can actually justify leaving it if the volume is low enough, okay? That line tends to be about 400 vehicles a day. There was actually a risk study that was done, that's published to the Transportation Research Board that actually showed, for instance, normally we put guide rail up as sort of the next to last thing with road so slopes, but delineation is last. We would actually flip that. We would actually put guide rail up last. We would leave the steep slope because the volumes are so low, it's hard to justify the economics and it's actually riskier to put up the rail, okay, economically. So that's what you, you have to justify that with a consistency. Uh, next question we've got here, is intersection site distance considered or just stopping site distance for local roads? The geometric standards don't get a lot into the issue of intersections. To be totally honest with you, they're really focused on the mainline sections. There is some stuff in there. We added a few things in intersections in our standards that we published because they weren't there. But there is some stuff in there about intersection site distance. The big thing there is to make sure you have good stopping site distance. And I actually recommend for new roads that decision stopping site distance that's available in the green book. It would increase your distances enough to make it a little bit safer, okay? Uh, the link to the 400 ADD study, if you download the green, the guidelines that's on our website, there's, the link is inside of there. I don't remember off the top of my uh, head what that is, but if you download the guidelines, they're linked right in there. That's a particular standard. Uh, why change the living book? It seems to oversimplify the standards. Actually, it turns out the standards weren't appropriate. Remember, I said that they found that what was happening was people were being held to the Green Book standards, which are actually very good for roadways with a higher volume. And some agencies probably want to continue to do the Green Book standards for roads above 400 vehicles a day. But under 400 vehicles a day, they're overkill. They're actually too much that you would need to follow. And people were losing lawsuits on roads that were actually appropriate and serving the needs of the public very well. And that was the reason why. Uh, driveway site distance. There was a little bit in there about driveways. There's also the, in that listing pretty well. So keep that in mind. But again, it is a thin book. It's only a, in a, you know, 150 pages or so versus the green book, which is much thicker. Okay. Uh, if there are utility poles that are off the road, originally allowed by the, allowed by the highway department, would not the usable right of way go out as far as where they were, even if not routinely maintained. Again, that's an issue of a road by use, which the roadway width changes depending on the roadway use. But remember, the utility poles are not part of the roadway, so they wouldn't necessarily drive where the right of way is. It would be drainage features, it would be slopes, it would be the end of a culvert pipe, okay? In fact, what I would actually recommend if you can get the utilities pushed up on the backside of the ditch, it's a much safer operation if you can do so. Not always easy to do, but that may or may not. The utility pole is not as likely to, okay? And by the way, a tree, you let a tree grow up, you lose that right of way. So you let a utility pole in, I don't know. I think it'd be a liability concern to let it in if it's in the wrong spot. And where can you get the little green book? On the handout, it, again, there's a link available in the chat pod, or you can get uh, it on the handout that we'll send to you, or you can download it off of the, our new information highway page. Uh, there's a link there. Ashto is the producer of the Little Green Book. We also, in our guidelines, have a link to it. Uh, I think the current price, it's electronic only, which is, I suppose, good right now. And I want to I th think we paid $125 for it as a member. And if you are a NACE member, you can get the member price. I've got time for two more. Let's see here. Does the local roads, uh, the setbacks to the end of a culvert pipe? There's not much in the standards about that other than having consistency on the slope. It does talk about consistency 
uh, that's about all it talks about. It doesn't talk about the uh, type of ends for the culverts, you know, things like that. That's something that we could talk about and maybe we'll do in a future webinar. And with that, I think we've got most of the questions that folks have asked. I wanna thank you very much. So great questions, great feedback. And with that, we will be sending a certificate for those of you who were on for most of the talk. And if you want a professional development hour and you stayed for more than 90%, or more than 50 minutes, 55 minutes, send us your certificate and we'll send you a professional development hour valid here in New York State. With that, I thank you. Have yourself a great day and a great weekend. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.